It's Thursday, the 21st of December. My name is Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel, and the NTSB has recently released a preliminary report on what happened to the Tennessee Fly Girl on the 7th of December when both her and her dad were fatally injured in a loss of control accident of their Beechcraft Debonair airplane. To better understand the content and context of this NTSB report, it's best if you've already watched the first video I published on this crash eight days ago. In that video, we go over extensively the function and use of the Century 2000 autopilot system that she had on board this aircraft at the time of the accident. On 7 December 2023, 1103 Central Standard Time, the Beach 35 C-33, that's the debonair straight tail version of the Bonanza, November 5891 Juliet was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near Pulaski, Tennessee. The private pilot and passenger sustained fatal injuries. The airplane was operated under FAR Part 91, General Aviation. The flight originated from Knoxville Downtown Island Airport, Knoxville, Tennessee, about 9.48 Central Standard Time and was en route to Saline County Regional Airport, Benton, Arkansas. That's where they were going to go get some avionics work done on the aircraft, and that would have been a good three-plus-hour long cross-country flight. Preliminary ADSB data revealed that after they took off from downtown Knoxville Airport, the airplane climbed and turned to a ground track of 255 degrees, which held pretty consistently, then leveled off for about 12 minutes at 2,500 feet before climbing to 6,400 feet, probably to stay below the Class C airspace there at Knoxville. The pilot was in contact with air traffic control and had requested flight following services, so there is some ATC data on this accident. As the flight was about 140 nautical miles into the trip, the controller advised the pilot that she was left of course. The pilot acknowledged and responded that she was correcting. Now, in a lot of the recent previous videos of uh, Tennessee Fly Girl, it sounded like the controllers kind of knew her call sign and knew of her and she got a lot of this from those local controllers where are you going what are you doing are you on course uh, do you need assistance about 10 19 so that's only uh, some 30 minutes or so after takeoff the airplane entered the first of a series of climbs and descents with corresponding fluctuations in its observed ground speed. And we looked at that on the ADSB data on FlightAware. During these oscillations, which varied in magnitude, the airplane's altitude varied between 6,400 feet and 5,300 feet. At about 1057, so they're struggling with this for, boy, almost a half an hour, the airplane entered a descent that a that was arrested at about 4,300 feet and at a ground speed of 143 knots, after which it climbed to 6,050 feet and slowed to 85 knots. The airplane then began to descend rapidly before the ADSB contact was lost in the vicinity of the accident site. During the last several seconds of the flight, the airplane was on a track of 262 degrees, descending at a ground speed that reached a maximum of 228 knots and the estimated maximum descent rate was around 11,900 feet per minute. During these altitude fluctuations, the controller twice provided instructions to the pilot to contact the Memphis Air Route Traffic Control Center. However, neither of the instructions were acknowledged by the pilot. They were getting out of range of that local controller. During the final moments of the flight, a faint communication from the pilot stating the airplane's registration in Debonair followed by an emergency declaration and an unintelligible word. About 60 seconds later, a faint and largely unintelligible transmission from the passenger was transmitted. That would be her dad, who is not a rated pilot. The controller's subsequent attempts to contact the pilot were unanswered, and there were no further communications from either the pilot or the passenger. A witness in the vicinity of the accident site stated that the airplane flew overhead at a high rate of speed and described that the engine was running when it impacted the ground. So it does not sound like a stall spin accident scenario, nor does it sound like the aircraft came apart in midair. All major components of the airplane were located at the accident site. So that's the four corners they always talk about. So it did not come apart in midair. The engine was partially buried in a crater that was five feet deep by eight feet wide. The engine was severely damaged by impact forces 
and they could not confirm the crankshaft continuity or cylinder compression because of the damage to the engine. The magneto key was broken off in the switch and set to the both position. Both magnetos separated from the engine during the accident sequence. They were damaged by impact forces and they could not be functionally tested. The spark plugs were impact damaged, but they checked they looked good with no display of uh, carbon or lead fouling. The propeller blade separated from the hub during the impact sequence. One blade was buried in the impact crater and the opposite was about 30 feet west of the main wreckage. And the buried blade exhibited a significant bend with cordwise scraping and leading edge gouges. All this seems to indicate that the engine was under power when the propeller hit the ground. The flight control system components from the cockpit to all control surfaces were significantly damaged or destroyed by impact forces and the post-impact fire. Flight control continuity could not be established. However, all observed breaks of the flight control cables displayed fracture features, which are indicative of tensile overload, having a broom straw appearance consisted with impact related separation. So all the discontinuities in the flight controls were caused by the impact of the crash. Here's what broom straw looks like. Here's what the broom straw appearance of these broken cables looks like from a different crash of a different airplane. Now here's the important part, the part I was looking for. The elevator trim was measured and correlated to about 5 degrees of trim tab deflection in the nose down direction. The rudder, left horizontal stabilizer, and elevator remained attached to the empennage and were free to move when manually manipulated. So it looks like the tail was intact, but she had a considerable amount of nose down trim. The maximum amount of nose down trim in the um, debonair is 10 degrees so she fully had half of her nose down trim that was available to her at the time of impact these control throws are listed in the original type certificate for each airplane and here's the original type certificate for the model 35 c 33 debonair where they give out the limits and specifications for the aircraft and here on control surface movements you've got the elevator itself which is rigged 25 degrees up and 15 degrees down elevator and the elevator trim tab is rigged 10 degrees up and 20 degrees down now that's the tab up with the elevator trim tab up 10 degrees that's nose down elevator trim she had five out of her 10 degrees in the elevator trim tab according to this report at the point of impact Remember now how these trim tabs work. Here is the horizontal stabilizer, here's the elevator, and here is the trim tab, just another flying surface. With the trim tab, elevator trim tab in the down position, that raises the elevator and that raises the nose of the aircraft. So this would be a nose up trim condition, which is gonna lower the trim tab on the elevator. Here's the nose down trim condition. The trim tab comes up a maximum of 10 degrees in the case of the debonair. The elevator is pushed down and you push the nose of the aircraft down. And this is the condition that they found her aircraft in at five degrees nose trim down. The cockpit was destroyed by impact forces and fire. No flight instrumentation or gauges could be identified or recovered. The airplane was equipped with a Century 2000 autopilot. And while the instrument panel faceplate was identified, no settings of the autopilot could be determined. The, the autopilot servos were damaged by impact and fire. The wreckage, including two intact digital recording devices, were retained for further examination. So there's a good chance that there may be a video recording of the crash itself. And if there is, that'll go a long way into explaining exactly what happened. And the weather was perfectly clear and light winds. Remember from the previous video, this aircraft was equipped with the Century 2000 autopilot without an electric trim. There was no electric trim on board the aircraft that electric trim would have been actuated by an electric trim switch here on the left yoke 
Instead, this aircraft was equipped with the Century 2000 with trim prompting. So you had to manually keep the aircraft in trim. So this would not be a case of runaway trim of the automation. It would be a case of the pilot getting the aircraft out of trim manually. Now, when you get the aircraft so far out of trim, even with the autopilot off, and she knew how to disconnect that autopilot quite easily. She had the autopilot disconnect switch right here on her left yoke, as well as the circuit breaker she was familiar with. But once you get that aircraft so far out of trim and the speed starts building up, the control forces that it takes to lift that nose up become greater and greater. And it may very well require both of your hands on the yoke to pull the aircraft up. If you've got both of your hands on the yoke, about the only thing you can do is key the mic for the radio or hit the autopilot off switch. But you may not be able, she may not have even been able to reach over to raise the trim on the nose and or just get off of the throttle. This is obviously no auto throttle on this thing either. And her dad, a non-rated pilot over in the right seat, may or may not have been able to help her. He could have even made things worse if he didn't understand the direction of the trim wheel if he reached over there in an effort to try to retrim the aircraft. In the heat of battle, he may have very well trimmed the aircraft in the wrong direction. And he had a tendency to do that before as seen in previous training videos. And a lot of Tennessee Fly Girl's previous videos have now been uh, removed from public view. Uh, it looks like only videos that are older than about 11 months are left up on her channel at the time of this recording. So hopefully the NTSB has got a chance to look at those most recent videos as they will go a long way towards explaining just how far over her head this pilot was in this high performance debonair that she acquired just one year ago and was struggling with the understanding of the operation of the Century 2000 autopilot. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.